Love you. Love you. Appreciate you. Thank you, guys. <sighs> when the when the mouth can't speak words, the tears do. The arms of Jesus stretched out, nailed, but stretched out for the whole world. The disciples argued with him about who would be at his right and his left hand. It turned out to be two thieves. Hmm. I have a friend, Baxter Kruger, who's a theologian, Mississippi theologian. So he sneaks up on guys with his good old boy persona. And uh, he was, uh, at one time, he was up in Colorado working with Operation Restored Warrior, which is an organization that helps special forces guys not kill themselves. And it's through encounter. And uh, he has a Presbyterian background, so he says they don't have visions, they have visuals. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of funny, isn't it? Yeah. So he was out one day just looking at the panorama of the mountains, and he had a visual. And the visual was there was a, a dam that stretched from horizon to horizon. And he was asking the Lord, what is this dam? And the Lord said, this is the dam that prevents, it's a beaver dam that prevents the flow of the river of the Holy Spirit. And it came through the dam in trickles because you know beavers leave spaces for water to come through so that the dams just don't bust. And at the bottom of this panoramic dam, there were two big logs, huge, huge, bigger than anything that he'd ever seen. And they attracted his attention, and he said, what are those two logs? And the Spirit said, they're the two logs that keep the dam from bursting. And he said, what are they? And he said, the biggest one down there is the lie of separation. And the other one is the lie that says that God is not good. Those are two of the logs in our own hearts that have to be destroyed. The lie of separation, that somehow your performance has not been good enough and it keeps God at a distance. That God the Father for whatever reason, can't look on you because he can't look on sin. Absolute lie. Absolute lie. From the beginning, you have been created in him. Not anything that has come into being has come into being apart from him. You are not apart from him. God does not live with expectations. That would mean he didn't know something. And the only... The only way to be disappointed is to have expectations. God has no expectations and therefore has never been disappointed in you. Ever. And you've never been separated. Jesus says to the disciples in just before the high priestly prayer in John 14, 20, in that day you'll finally know that I'm in the Father you are in me, and I am in you. And that didn't require a sinner's prayer. It's like, that one's a couple hundred years old. What happened to everybody before the sinner's prayer? Right, right. <laughs> you know, they got kind of left out, you know. 
you have been from the moment of your conception in Christ, and Christ has been in you. Therefore, the Father and the Spirit have been in you, and you've been in the Father and the Spirit also. Because you can't have an experience with one without all three being there. God has never been alone. When he hung on that cross, the Father and the Spirit were with him. When I, you saw it in the movie, if you saw the, the Shaq movie. And uh, Mm. Thanks. There is a scene where Mackenzie and, and Papa God have been sort of in an argument. Mackenzie has been pushing. And Papa says, holding out her wrists that have nail scars in them, and says, don't you ever think that what my son chose to do didn't affect all of us referring to the Father and the Spirit. The other log is the goodness of God. Can I tell you that God has never killed a human being? Ever. That the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, has been a movie about how human beings lost in their darkness are beginning to perceive the goodness of God. And God submits to all that darkness. God submits to folk tales that have been drug over from Baal and Marduk and the Egyptian gods where their gods were always killing. Their sacrifices were, were mostly focused on children. And that was so abhorrent to God that when God began to teach Abram, who became Abraham, because God put his name right in the center of Abram's name, the breath of God, the H of God, and did the same for Sarai, who became Sarah, so that they would bear the name of the Father. And God is so inten intense on teaching Abraham that he doesn't kill people and does not kill children, especially. That he tells Abraham to take his own son up on the mountain and kill him. And Abraham, who has grown up with the gods of Ur of the Chaldees, the fish gods, Nanu and Ningal, who sacrifice children, he just figures, well, this is what gods do. And his son, who's about 30 years old at this time, we, we like to play a game that he was 12, you know, so that somehow we can come up with an age of accountability, you know, so that my people made that up, by the way. <laughs> my people are Western evangelical fundamentalists, you know. Those are my people, and I care for them deeply. And I, I grieve that they're so lost in a God, in a relationship with a God who's not good. And so they go up, he, he submits, this 30-year-old. And they go up on the mountain, and as the knife is coming down, God says, stop. He says, look. I'm going to tell you something new that you didn't know about me. And as often God did, it was in a new name. And this one was Jehovah Jireh. It's the first time used. And it means, I will provide myself. If you need a sacrifice, if you need one, I will provide myself. We know later that the prophets declared, the statement of God is that he hates sacrifice. He hates it. It was never the intention, and we drug it into 
our way of thinking that had to be dealt with. And the only way you deal with darkness is with light. You don't try to deal with darkness through more darkness. You don't try to deal with life by using death. When God declares, all right, you are so lost. And did you know that in the story of Moses going up on the mountain, there was an invitation to the entire congregation of Israel to go up on the mountain and to have a big party. The invitation was, come up, see me face to face. And because they were afraid, they said, Moses, you go. And they created a priesthood. The declaration of God is that he is king of king and lord of lords and, and the high priest of a priesthood. Guess what? We're the kings and we're the lords that he's talking about. And we're all a priesthood of believers. In fact, the whole world is, but they don't know it yet. And so they are supposed to go up, but out of fear they don't. And they're given the law because at least it's better than nothing. It's not as good as being face to face where the law gets written on your hearts and you begin to live from the inside out. So the law that is given is from the outside in because it's definitely better than calves made out of earrings. And there begins to be a, a teaching journey and one of those laws is what? Thou shalt not kill. And God is beginning to teach them that my ways are not your ways. It is love that overcomes our propensity to kill. My people use that law as a justification to kill. And at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus declares, if you have hatred in your heart for anyone, you have murdered them already. This is a new kingdom. This is not the kingdom of this world. You're not separated. You've never been separated. You can't be separated. You have been created in Christ. You're sustained. You're upheld. You're carried. You're carried... In Isaiah, you're carried in the womb of the Father. You're carried in the womb of the Father. And he will, even to your graying years, he will carry you, and then he will deliver you. You want a metaphor for God being a woman? Read Isaiah. We know that those are metaphors. If a metaphor becomes concrete as it has for my people as a white old bearded guy you're now you're now dabbling in idolatry metaphors they're there to help us grasp ideas and flashes and pictures of the way God is so no separation and goodness you see these songs? The goodness of God. Where does God live? In you. In you. In you. And the goodness of God begins to move from you so that you can participate into the world. Did you know you're made in the image of of a God who is only good all the time. Therefore, the truth of who you are is that you're only good. But we're blind and we're lost. And therefore, we think that we are totally depraved and have a sin nature. That is a lie. An absolute lie, like separation. Do you, know, do you know that you are kind? Did you know that you are patient by nature? Did you know that you are a truth teller by nature? And if you don't know who you are by nature, then the ways of your being will match what you do believe that you are by nature. 
And therefore, if you believe you're a piece of crap, you're going to act like one, and you're going to think you are one, and you're going to let people treat you like one. Wholeness is when the ways of your being are an expression of the truth of your being. And as a person thinks in their heart about the truth of their being, so they are in the ways of their being. Sin has got nothing fundamentally to do with the ways of your being, with behavior. That's just an expression of what you believe to be the truth of your being. Sin is that you don't know the truth of your being. You are not just made in the image of God. You are in union with the image of God who is, he is the perfect image who is Jesus. And where Jesus comes, the Father and the Spirit are. Did you know you are pure of heart by nature? If you don't, you're going to get stuck in porn, like I did. You're going to get stuck in ways of relating to people as if they're objects, like I did. Because I thought that I was my behavior. That my behavior communicated to me what the truth of who I am is. And it was a lie. You know what destroyed porn in my life, which I hated and therefore hated myself? It was to find out that the Holy Spirit would open my inside eyes to the reality that I am pure of heart. And I am self-controlled. That's an inside-out reality. Self-discipline, outside-in. And therefore it becomes a law. God has written the law of life on hearts of flesh. And now we get to live from the inside out in our union with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who are pure of heart, who are self-controlled, who are kind. The love who is God is agape. First John, right? God is agape. What is agape? Obviously, not, it's not infatuation, right? Infatuation is, is the projection of your need on someone. It's kind of porn in the flesh, right? It's a, it's the, it's, it is based on not knowing someone, but ex pushing your own brokenness out and projecting on someone. And as soon, you know what destroys infatuation? Getting to know them. Right? Infatuation is based on not knowing. Everything about agape is knowing. As soon as you get to know someone you're infatuated with, it destroys the imagination. Right? Getting to know God is eternal life. This is eternal life that you know Him and the one who He sent. Right? <clears throat> knowing anyone, <clears throat> the, the love you have expands around the knowing. You start with a baby, and you love that baby. Even in the womb, you love that baby, but you don't know that baby yet. You know that baby exists, and it's enough. And yet, when that baby is birthed and begins to be a more discernible human being, your love starts to grow. It's really as that baby grows. The more you get to know a human being, your love for them expands. See, it's not love that grows, it's knowing that grows, and love simply is the skin of knowing. Know one another, know, right? And so God is agape. Agape is what? It's other-centered, self-giving, co-suffering love. It's not selfless, because if it was selfless, there would be nobody to love from. Selfless has no substance. It is self-giving. This is a God who is love. And so if you go to 1 Corinthians 13, it has a whole list of, of the reality of who God is, because it says agape is. Agape is kind. 
Agape is patient. Agape is long-suffering. Agape is pure of heart. Agape keeps no record of wrongs. That should tamper with our idea of eternal conscious torment. <laughs> eternal conscious torment is absolutely centered on and requires a record of wrongs. We have this idea that God is a judge in a courtroom. Why? Why do we have that idea? Well, because Calvin was a lawyer, Luther was a lawyer, Augustine was a lawyer. I have friends who are lawyers and I love them, but they work in contract law, and we don't. The kingdom of God is not about contract, it is about contract as opposed to covenant. You know, let me give you a really good example of what covenant means. Covenant means that you're never going to be my enemy. But what inhibits our personal intimacy will be the enemy. The enemy is anything that restricts personal intimacy. You are made in the image and likeness of God. But it's those things which have hidden that in your life that are the enemy. It could be your family system. It could be your addiction. It could be those kinds of things that impede, but I'm not going to make you the enemy. A contract is, you violate this performance, you are the enemy. And we have remedies for that. We're going to punish you. We have this imagination that we're going to go into this courtroom and God the Father is the judge. And the determination is, are, are you guilty? Am I guilty? And it's kind of like, duh, you know, because it's based on behavior, right? That whole courtroom scene is based on behavior. Now, here's a problem. Even though God the Father, might, the judge, might love you, he's under what? The law. God the Father is under the law. That's a problem. Because if God the Father is under the law, who is the real God? The law. If God is submitted to the law, the law is actually God. That is a problem. So now you come into this, this it's called forensic theology, right? You come into the forensic being legal. You come into the courtroom, God who is under the law, might love you, but he has to submit to the law, and therefore you have to be punished yep. because you are a sinner. So the good news is in that forensic theology that, there's, that there is a defense attorney right. that if you pay him, yeah. right. he will protect you from the father who might love you but is under the law. How do you pay him? You pray the sinner's prayer. I don't know how you paid him before the sinner's prayer, but that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> and you, because, you know, you are, are, by nature, a sinner. So, if you pay the defense attorney, then he will protect you from God the Father, who is under the law. Okay. And how will he do that if you by nature are a sinner? Well, two ways. One is he's going to cover your, your sinful nature so that he can sneak you into heaven without God the Father or the law knowing. And God the Father is going to go, do you smell that piece of... It smells like... Mm. And, and, and Jesus is going to go... No. <laughs> Justification, propitiation, you know. And, and by being under the robe of Jesus, with all these good smelling things, you're going to be at home in heaven, right? No. 
If there is any shade of darkness in you, you will not feel at home in relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why the determination of the one who loves you is to destroy everything in you that is not of love's kind. This is a furious fire who has not made you the enemy, but everything that keeps you from being fully human and fully alive. For God is a fire, but that fire is for you. God is a consuming fire, but he's not there to consume you because this is a covenant. He is there to destroy everything that keeps you from being fully human and fully alive. The other thing that this defense attorney is supposed to do, he goes, now I will take your punishment, right? I mean, in the forensic model, that now that you paid Jesus as a defense attorney, he's going to take the punishment. What's the punishment? Eternal conscious torment, right? Did Jesus ever do that? Nope. Jesus has never spent eternity in conscious torment. And if that's the penalty, what happened? Either the model is wrong, or we just don't understand it. Well, I'll try to understand it. It's impossible. Because if that's the penalty, then what happened? So we got a problem. The forensic model cannot be right. It just can't. So what's the model? Well, the early church had a model that wasn't forensic at all. They had a model of judgment and punishment. It was, it was a model, but what did the model look like? Did you go into a courtroom? Absolutely not. You know where you went? To a hospital. And God is a doctor. Do you want to be... You, why would you go to a hospital? Because I'm sick. Something's broken in me. Something's not working right. So when you go to a doctor, do you want to be judged? Absolutely. Why would I go to a doctor if I didn't want to be judged? I want the doctor to go, yep, you're sick. And I know why you're sick. I know why you have this addiction. I know why you treat people the way you do. I know why you're abusive in your marriage. I know why. The doctor knows. Do you want to be punished? Absolutely. I, I want a cast on my arm that's broken. I, I want the penicillin for... I want an antibiotic. Something for what purpose? Is that punishment for the purpose of making you feel punished? No. It's for healing and restoration. That's the goal of a doctor. To do no harm. It's on their statement. And you know, there's this snake on this staff that looks like a cross as their symbol. Why? Because remember Moses? When, when everybody is getting killed by these little niggling little serpents and they're going around through the camp and they're biting people and people are getting sick and they're dying. And God says, put a serpent on a staff and drive it into the ground and anybody that looks at that cross will see a redemption of the serpent that reverses what happened in the garden. And Jesus is therefore the redemption of the serpent. And all these little things that are hurting us, all these little addictions, all these little blindnesses, all this stuff, it is redemption. And that's why those who heal have that as their symbol. And they say, do no harm. That is the nature of God, to do no harm. And the crazy thing is that we think God does harm. God never does harm. God ne 
2 Samuel 14, 14. In the mouth of a woman, God never takes away a life, but always plans for the banished one to be restored. If I am lifted up, I will drag all human beings to myself. The word is drag. It uses draw, which is Old English. But the word in the, in the Greek is to drag. It's only used in that, in that construction three different times. One is when the nets were so full they had to drag it onto the shore. The other one is where Paul and Silas get in trouble with the leaders of a city and they're dragged before the council before they're put into prison. I will drag everyone to myself. That where I am, you may be also. That is why when Jesus dies, we died. Because we are in him. The entire race of human being is in him. When he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. And when he ascended, we ascended, and we are now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is the kingdom of God? It is in you. Where is the holy of holies, the naos? It is in you. You are the temple of the living God, and it's not the entire temple, it's the naos, which is the holy of holies, where the presence of God is. That's who you are. And that's where the activity and the work of God moves from, healing you from the inside, opening up your inside eyes. Look at, the, look at the prayers of Paul. I pray that the inside eyes would be opened up so that you can see the length, the height, the width, the depth of the God who dwells in you. Is this good news? It's good news because there's a good God. So there's two things that we all need to destroy, the two big logs. The idea that we're separated and that God is not good all the time. Now here's, here's the kicker. What I've just told you is true for every single human being on the planet. You will not meet a human being who's not indwelt by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because if they were, they'd instantly lapse into non-being. That's a statement of the early church. And if you, if you meet a human being in, in whom Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not dwell, that's lapsing into non-being, but you will not meet a human being who does not live inside the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not anything that came into being came into being apart from Him. For it is Christ who is in you. When He says, you'll finally understand that I'm in the Father, you are in me and I'm in you. These guys are far from being followers of Jesus. I mean... And on Mars Hill, Acts 17, if you want to understand what I'm saying, read Acts 17, and then read it again, and then read it again, and then read it again. This is Paul talking to pagans. For we live and move and have our being in him. This is Paul who talks about the Damascus Road experience as when I was separated from my, mo my mom's womb, from the time of my mother's room, womb, God had separated me out, and here I am killing, and here I am destroying, and even though I'm this very religious man. And when God was pleased to reveal himself, not to me, but in me, and now I preach him in the Gentiles. That's the actual statement. Acts 17. Like even your poets have said, we are all God's offspring, and he has given to every one of us life and breath and everything. And therefore, as the children of God, he's still talking to pagans who don't have a clue. And when you begin to understand that every human being that you are in front of is a, is a holy place, a holy of holy place, Holy's place in whom the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwell, you will begin to relate to people differently. 
because you will no longer just see the flesh, their presentation, the ways that they are lost. You will begin to speak to the truth of who they are and not to just simply their behaviors. Do you believe that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? <laughs> for I know, this is the one that's always used, it's in Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So what's the plan? That you will come and seek me. Now, we don't interpret it that way because we like the idea that, that God has this big plan for us, right? Like it's a perfect plan. That's not what it's talking about. You know, you know who the perfect plan is? Jesus, the Messiah. That is the perfect plan of God. Because if God was an engineer and had this perfect plan for your life as if it was a, you know, a plan. <laughs> I have this plan for you. My people, we had the perfect plan and we had the permissive plan. Right? Yeah. right? Because obviously we've screwed up the perfect plan. I mean, how many sins does it take? <laughs> I had this perfect plan for you and look, you keep screwing it up. If God had a perfect plan for you, then he'd be in a constant state of disappointment. Think about it, right? So the, the, the reason my people had a permissive plan, and it's like you had to do a big thing, you had, you know, because you couldn't just do a bad thing, because you'd be, you know. So the perfect plan for my denomination, for a lot of us, was to become a missionary. But when we screwed up the perfect plan and you had to, you know, like you committed adultery like I did or something like that, then, um, then you'd end up with a permissive plan. You couldn't be a missionary anymore. You'd be a plumber or something. <laughs> oh, sorry. You are a plumber, Jamie? Oh, good, because your house is a mess as far as plumbing. Right now it is. I know two of your toilets just have, have a mind of their own. And, uh, and no meanness to plumbers, you know. I'm, I'm talking about the viewpoint of my people. Because plumbing was not like being a missionary. So there was a perfect plan. And that's when I would ask, how many sins does it take to screw up a perfect plan? I'm thinking one. So what iteration am I on? Like, I'm kind of million down, you know. I, God's like, great, another one. Oh, another one. Shoot, another one. You know, all these perfect plans. God is an artist. I have a friend named Martin Schleski. Um, it's 11.37, when am I done? Mm, I love you, brother. Yeah. You have no idea what you just said. So I have this friend, Martin Schleski. He is one of the, the best violin makers in the world. And uh, one of the greatest joys in, uh, in my life was that I was speaking at a church in his town and Martin came with a violin. And he played my life. He played it on a violin. And he played the sexual abuse that I'd experienced. And he played the abandonment, and he played the abuse from my dad, and he played, and it was, it was just tortured. He tortured the strings on this violin. And he, he then there were these, these moments of light and moments of sound that came through, but then would, be, would, would disappear inside the, the losses. And then they'd show up again, and then he played the losses around um, me committing adultery with one of my wife's best friends. And then, which is in 94, and then he, he played the slow movement of redemption that kind of found its way 
through these tortured notes, and slowly this beauty began to emerge, and the redemption of Jesus began to emerge inside these sounds. And slowly it became this beautiful thing, and there was this reconciliation, this 11 years of breaking that, I, that took place, and the hope of redemption with Kim that took 11 years. And the dealing with all the crap and the garbage and the hellish journey that was, he played it. And then this beautiful, internal, soft melody began to emerge and it began to express itself. And there were notes that connected with other notes and it was stunning. And I cried through the whole thing. And I didn't even know he was going to do it. His violin shop is in the house of Teresa of Avila, which is a mystic, a really amazing human being. And the reason that it was there, that he has his violin shop there, is only because during World War II, that town was the only one that hadn't been leveled by bombing. And right at the end, right before the Germans had given up, a squadron of bombers had been sent there to level this city. And the German commander of that city heard that they were coming. And the, the leader of the bomber squadron had been told that that's what his mission was, to level this city of which Teresa of Avila's little home was. And the German commander told his entire army in the city to put sheets out on the top of the buildings, white sheets. And when the bomber commander saw the white sheets, he violated his orders and didn't drop the bombs. And the commander violated his orders and didn't fight. And that city was not flattened. And therefore, Teresa of Avila's home wasn't flattened. And now that's where he lived. And Martin, Martin has a book called The Clang, which is now in the English called The Sound of God's Unspeakable Beauty. The Clang means the sound. And uh, I was sitting talking to... Um, a friend of mine who is involved in publishing in Germany, Carol. And Carol says, we, sat, we, were, we saw each other at this uh, book fair, and uh, we sat, we took some time, and we sat together. And she says, Paul, what are you working on right now? And I said, the four spiritual lies. I don't know if you ever saw that little pamphlet thing called the four spiritual laws. And it starts with God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which, which links the love of God to your fulfillment of this plan because that's how they look at it. And so um, I, I was saying I'm working on the four spiritual lies. Um, Baxter calls them the four spiritual flaws. And, uh, and she says, what's that? And I, and I explained to her how you go from this first one to where you have bridge theology, where you're separated from God and Jesus becomes the bridge. And if you pay Jesus, you get to go across the bridge, you know, all of that. And... Uh, and I said, look, there are so many things in this world that are not part of God's plan. They're just wrong. Do you think it's part of God's plan that a baby is, is brutalized? You know, but Christians, we're kind of stuck in that mentality that when something happens, it's part of God's plan. And so I was, I was just going after this with Carol. I didn't know that Carol had a, a best friend who is a world-class stuntman. And, uh, and he was on, he's a follower of Jesus, and he was going on international television to do a stunt that he had done hundreds of times, where he was catapulted and would do gymnastics over a lot of moving cars that were coming toward him. And the last is a truck that was driven by his father. And, uh, and right before he was going to do the stunt, some of his Christian friends came to him and said, look, 
You're going to be on international television. You need to be thinking about what you're going to say when they interview you after the stunt. And because he was thinking about that, he missed the stunt. And as he flew over, his father hit him with the truck. And he was an instant quadriplegic. I've met him. I know him. And uh, he, he drove his cart right over my foot the first time we met. <laughs> and, uh, but he hit this thing, and it just absolutely changed his life. And his friends came and said to his mom, isn't it, look at the, the plan of God that now he will have such a greater reach because he has been damaged inside of this. And that kind of comment, his mom just says, if this is God and these are God's plans, I want nothing to do with this God. And she turned her back and walked away. Do you blame her? It's not the plan of God Special, right? There you go. Like, I'm not needing to use both hands at the same time. So, you know that a baby is born into absolute poverty and, and is abused? And that's not the plan of God. That's just wrong. And God is working inside the expanse of humanity to to be the redeeming genius without the violation of personal agency. We can't even do that with our kids. Right? We violate their personal agency all the time. And it takes time for us to learn like, oh, okay, oh, I've got to trust the Holy Spirit in them rather than play the Holy Spirit in them. Right? The young people are going, yeah, yes! <laughs> Some of them are, oh, I wish my parents were here. <laughs> so, God is not an engineer. He doesn't have a template for a perfect plan. And Martin talks about this. And so I, I told Carol about what I was working on, not knowing about this situation. She goes back to the mom and tells her about what I said. And, she, and her mom turns around and walks back into a relationship with Jesus. Just because of that conversation and the ripple effects. I don't know about this. On my birthday the next year, I get a note from Carol and she tells me about this. And then she begins to explain something about Martin's work. Do you know that the violin makers of old would go looking for a specific kind of tree called the singers? It's okay. I have a phone too. You're not calling me, are you? Okay. I have mine muted. So, um, I don't know. So, it happens to me fairly regularly. So Martin, well, the old, old violin makers, right? The old violin makers would go up into the mountains looking for these singers. They were a very special kind of tree. And uh, what they would do is the violin makers would meet at where rivers connected. We know one river's coming this way, one river's coming this way. The violin, I mean, the lumber, the lumberjacks, they would go up into the mountains and cut down trees. And then they'd put them into the rivers. And then the the, the trees would be coming down the rivers and they would bang into each other at these junctures and the singers would let out a tone. And then they would take these singers and buy them from the lumber, the lumber guys and, uh, and, and they would then cure these uh, pieces of wood over like 30 years and they were the pieces of wood that were used to carve out the bodies of the violins, because they had an ability to have tone and sound like no other um, pieces of wood on the planet. 
Nowadays, Martin will go for a couple months up into the mountains with a tuning fork looking for the singers. He would hit the tuning fork, and if it was a singer, it would let out a tone. Right? And those are the ones that he takes uh, now for the next generation that are being taught how to build or how to craft violin bodies. Pretty amazing, right? But here's what they have discovered about why those singers are singers. A, they are a unique kind of tree that usually grow in a grove of trees, usually with a kind of soil. And here's the thing about them. When another tree goes down next to a singer, and, that, and the wind hits it differently, and the light hits it differently, or the ground has changed and leached out a, a number of its soil properties, that singer will change. It will, it will twist in order to deal with the wind or the sun, and it will gain different nutrients, and every cell in those singers will change as a result of what they experience. And now, when you've got this piece of wood, a singer, and Martin begins to work with a planer in order to, to figure out how to craft that, he said, if you had a mathematical print of what a violin should look like, you will violate that wood. You will violate the wood because you've got to be sensitive to where this twist is or that turn is, and you craft it according to the wood's experiences. You see where I'm going? He says, transformation is not about the wood submitting to the artist, it's about the artist submitting to the wood. When God is at work in your life, God submits to your history, right? Your history, your experiences don't just disappear. They are redeemed in the making of release of your sound. Your sound. I have a friend, Rob Parsons, who, who wrote a book. Um, and in it, he talks about being in a, in a university situation where the speaker was a, a geneticist and was asked, could we uh, clone Beethoven? And he said, yes and no. He said, we could take out of his body, out of the, the bones uh, in the coffin, his genetic makeup, and we could, we could clone him so that you would have someone who looks exactly like him. He said, but no. And, and, um, and a little more, you could teach that human being who's a clone how to play a violin um, and, and music at a pretty high prof, uh, level. But he said no, because Beethoven's father was an alcoholic. And Beethoven's mother, who he loved dearly, died in his early childhood. And Beethoven had to his father was such an alcoholic and abusive that Beethoven had to care for the two younger boys and raise them himself. And then he turned to alcoholism and became an alcoholic. And then he was working on music that wasn't recognized, but just as his music was beginning to be recognized, he started losing his hearing. And out of that loss, oh, the, the love of his life died a woman he intended, intended to marry died. And so out of all of that experience, the, the trauma of it and the work of it came Beethoven's sixth through ninth um, ah, symphonies, thank you. And they're the ones that we, that we listen to as classic Beethoven with the poundingness and the anger and the angst. Out of that, did God plan for Beethoven to to have an alcoholic father who abused him so that he could do these symphonies. No! These symphonies are the redemption of Beethoven's experience. And so when God begins to work on your life, he is sensitive 
to what your experience is and what your family is and what your culture is and what your color is and all those things that go into making you so unique and he will not violate it because he wants the release of the sound that you are. That's the redeeming genius. I was writing all about this, this whole story, and as I finished the last line, the doorbell rang, and UPS had dropped off a package. I have a friend, it was from a friend of mine who's a pastor on the East Coast in Virginia, and as a hobby, he takes 1800s pieces of metal, and he works as a forger and as a blacksmith and turns them into things. And without me knowing, he had done this as a gift for me. And he had sent this package, and this is just like a minute or two after I finished writing about what I just told you. And I go and open the package, and in it are two planers as bookends. And I go, you are so funny, <laughs> right? This is a God who is good all the time, who is working inside the uniqueness of who you are to free you to be the sound that you were always intended to be that is now connected with your life, your history, your trauma, the things that you have experienced, plus the joys you have, plus all the good things that have happened in your life, the beauty and the wonder, all of that that makes you you, he is going to protect in the redemption of all things, but you still have the nail scars on your wrists. You still have that. It, your history doesn't just disappear. It is now woven into the grand redemption so that you can be fully yourself, fully human, with a sound that is uniquely you. To the praise of the glory of the Father who loves you. Who's especially fond of you. God is not a controller. God is an artist and works within everything that you have experienced to redeem it, to redeem it. Holy Spirit, Papa God, Jesus, open our inside eyes, please. Help us make a declaration that is constant and ongoing, that we will fight the fight of declaring that you are not good and that we are separated. May we learn how to destroy those lies in our own heart and mind. May we fight the good fight in our union with you. May we hear the whispers, I have always loved you. And we are going to heal the broken parts. And I do no harm. And you can actually trust me. And you can let go of control. And you can let go of certainty other than in my goodness. And together, we will live in eternity. Amen. That was so just rich and beautiful and eloquent. And I hope you leave today just with this understanding that those two logs he talked about have to be removed. The lie of separation and the lie that God is not good. And I know that here at Hill City, these are the two things that we're working on to chop away out of our lives so that the Holy Spirit can truly flow and we can live in the beauty that Paul was talking about. And so I was going to say, I hope like me, you were encouraged, but I already know you were. And so that was so beautiful. Can we just put it up, put our hands together, give it up. There we go for Paul, Paul Young. for truly 
blessing us today. That was, that was so good. And I'm so glad that I can now call Paul my new friend. And he only meets friends. And so if you'd like to meet him, maybe get one of his amazing hugs. I know he's going to be here in the lobby. I have been asked by several of you about maybe if Paul would take the time to maybe sign one of the books maybe you brought. I, I think he will do that for you. You can ask, but I already know he probably will. And uh, yeah, so I just want to say thank you, Paul. I appreciate you, your heart, what you were able to impart all weekend and then even this morning into this place, into Hill City. And so I just want to say thank you for just coming out today to be encouraged, to be equipped. And as you leave today, I want to remind you, as we always do, you are loved and there is nothing you can do about it. So go connect somebody to life this week. We will see you next Sunday. Bishop Jamie's in the house. Hope to see you then. God bless you all.